Hi, I'm Randy Robison. This is Life Today TV, and I have author and speaker. Do you speak some too? Yes, I do. Okay, I thought she did. <laughs> Mary Demuth is with me. You might have read some of her books, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. I know the Defiance Texas trilogy did real well, um, and then your book on for, with mothers. What was it? Ordinary Mom, Ordinary. Extraordinary, Extraordinary God. Okay, Ordinary Mom, Extraordinary God. I knew we can get that right. <laughs> uh, has been read, read by by lots of people. She has a new book out. It is called everything and um well it's about I, I would ask yeah what's this about <laughs> but i mean it's about everything but no this is actually this is very personal uh it's it's nonfiction, mm -hmm. but it reads um uh, i was noticing almost like a fiction which makes it really easy to read but this has a lot of your story in here where did where did this kind of germinate this came about because uh, my husband and I were church planting in southern France. I know we were suffering for Jesus while we were there. <laughs> I've been uh, people there. thought yeah. people thought we were you know not suffering, but we were. And uh, while we were there, we just had um, so many issues go on. We ended up selling our home back in the states to a con man, and had to were forced to go into foreclosure. And our church planting team kind of imploded, and we had. Um, extreme spiritual warfare where our youngest daughter was hearing satanic voices oh and they didn't go away until she met Jesus and later was baptized in the Mediterranean Sea, which was an awesome story. But in the midst of all that turmoil, I said to the Lord, what in the world are you doing? Why are you doing this to me? But yet in the aftermath of all of it, about two years later, I realized that most of my growth that I can point back to right now has been a result of the deprivation and all the trials that I went through when I lived in France. Mm. And so this book came out of this desire of what, what does make us grow? What's that question? How do we grow as Christians? And, and really for me, it just came down to learning to let go and to letting go of what you expect things to be and how they should be and, and the trials that come. Okay, I got about five questions now. Okay, uh, good. I don't know where That's to go. good. But do you, do you tell the the stories of, of your daughter in this book? I do. Okay. I do. And you tell the story. I know you tell, talk about the church itself and the struggles that you went through. What was the biggest obstacle you faced in France and trying? Was it was it just the organizational part, or was it the people? What what do you think the problem? You was? know, it wasn't the French people. We we got along with them well. Most people that we met there were atheists, and it actually worked out quite well. We had good conversations, and my um, how does that work out well if you're planning a church if they're <laughs> I know, atheists? I know. But what was cool is my eldest daughter ended up um, leading someone to the Lord, and it was her little atheist friend. So it was really a cool experience to see her do that. But I think the hardest thing for us is um, what happens to most, most missionaries is team dynamics. It wasn't money. It wasn't the culture. It was none of that. It was just we had a team implode. And when you go overseas with a group of people and you think, this is going to be awesome, and you have this, so, you're so excited, and then it goes, Phew then it, it gets harder. So what did, is there still a church there? or did it... there, there is, okay. thankfully. We, um, what we did is after the team kind of blew up, we recruited a French couple to, to live there and to really do the work. And they're doing the things that we really wanted to do but couldn't because we were Americans. Mm. So they're actually reaching out to marginalized Muslims in the south of France, which is a huge ministry because typically wow. the French people don't like Muslims. Yeah. And so to have this French couple show the love of Jesus to these people who just came in from a boat who have absolutely mm -hmm. nothing and they're giving them food, they're moving them in, they're bringing furniture to them, they're loving them, they're doing these kids clubs, all these kids are coming to Christ who are Muslim kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I could tell you their name, but then they would be in trouble. So I can't yeah, do that, yeah, but um, yeah. they're doing a great work there. And so we feel like all of that stress that we went through was just to get them there. Hmm. That's and then we very went cool. Home. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, well, and let me ask you about that. What did you find when you came back home and now you're back in an American church? Um, that was a really interesting thing for me just to kind of look at the American church and have that blessing of perspective, if that makes sense. So um, I was able to kind of look at the church and say, what is it about the church that makes it not grow? What, what are some of the problems? And, and you usually can't see that unless you leave your culture and then you come back. And so the thing that I saw the most was that Americans tend to be the answer to their own prayers. 
um, if you get sick, you can go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. If you are financially stressed out, there's someone you might be able to go to or you'll pull money out of your bank or you'll use your credit card. There's always an answer to it. And I remember my friend back in Ghana who, if he gets sick, he has to pray. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no, he can't go to a doctor. He doesn't yeah. have the money. And so I realized that in this culture where we can be the answer to our own prayers, we have deified control and that most of us micromanage our relationship with God. We even tell God the way we want to grow right. and we don't relinquish that control and let him really have control. So you see people in the third world growing like crazy because they have to, yeah. they have to rely on Jesus. And we have in America so many obstacles to get to that place of pure, an adult, you know, um, just this pure kind of faith of, kind of a desperation, yes, for desperation yeah. faith of giving that everything to him so that we can gain the everything that he has for us. Mm. No, that, that strong self-sufficiency can be a blessing, yes. but I can see how it would, if you forget your first love, you know, exactly. be a curse. Yeah. Be a curse. Now, one thing you do talk about that I find uh, striking is the really it, it's it's like whoa is the way we tend to get people into the church and and kind of dumb down the gospel for them just to get them to maybe walk down the aisle yeah it's like the big bait and switch thing that happens um and i call it the a y d i gospel all you do is gospel <laughs> And so we, we tell people, okay, to become a Christian, all you do is say the simple prayer. And then once they get a little further in, we say, all you do is, you know, get baptized. Mm -hmm. All you do is join the church. And then you just keep going in the stair step, step until you get to like nirvana of tithing and missionaryhood, you know, <laughs> right. where you're really a Christian. Right. But in actuality, we're not doing them any favors because they think, oh, well, all of a sudden all these trials come their way, which will happen because the kingdom of darkness will be angry that they have made that decision. And they'll be bewildered. They'll say, all, you told me all I needed to do is say this prayer when we really need to start with the gospel in its whole entirety of all you need to do is lay down your life for the sake yeah. of Christ. Yeah. All you need to do is follow him. And what did Jesus do? He died on the cross. I mean, he, if he did that and we are to be his followers, then, you know, it's, it's that kind of gospel. It's, yeah. a, it's a dying to self and, and looking to what he wants us to do. Yeah, it's, it's not as easy as we want to make it sound sometimes. Right. You know, um, but certainly... The, the blessings come when you take that full dive. Yes, and that's yeah. the subtitle of the book, um, what you give and what you get to become like Jesus. You give everything, but in return you get everything. Mm, yeah. And that's been the question that people have asked me before. They'll say, why, why are you close to Jesus? Or how can I have this like deep, intimate relationship with him? And I'll, I'll just say, you know, you've just got to walk through it with him. You've got to give it up. You've got to give up your agenda. You've got to give up you know, what your hopes and dreams are. And he usually fulfills them in a more interesting way. But we like to cling to what we think is ours. And we think that our world will fall apart if we let go. Like when we lost our house, I used to think there was someone that lived behind me um, before we left to France and they lost their house. And I used to think to myself, I could never go through that. <laughs> I, I never, you should never say that out loud. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> and then when it happened to me, I thought, yeah, it's okay. And I struggled with it and I cried and I got upset. And then the Lord said to me, Mary, do you really believe that I own the cattle on a thousand hills or do you not? And I finally got to see where the rubber met the road of my faith. Yeah. And I was like, okay, either I believe it or I don't. Mm -hmm. And I finally got to that place where I said, okay, Jesus, take my house. I don't care. You can have it. I'm going to trust you. If people will just read your book, they can learn those lessons without having to actually lose their home. Isn't that, that be great? I think that's a great selling point for the book. <laughs> Buy the book. Don't go into foreclosure. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Uh, now, now, that's a great, we just had a great topical interview right here on her book. Now, I'm going to ask you some personal questions. Awesome. Okay. About, this is about the author. This is that little, about the author part. You write fiction and you write nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Which do you prefer? I actually have always believed that I am a novelist, a storyteller, and I think that comes out in my nonfiction by the fact that I'm always telling yeah, stories within right. that. So I primarily love to write fiction and spin stories because I believe that we can kind of get the truth of the gospel in in such a winsome, in, invitational way in the power of a story. Yeah. 
No, but the stories in this book are real, right? Yes, not, they're not, not fictional. No, okay. no, they're real. <laughs> what, what's your? Do you, do you have any obstacles, any struggles with writing, or are you one of those free flowing kind of <laughs> just sit down on a weekend and Josh McDowell it just <laughs> right? <laughs> that's how he does it. That I know that's impressive. I um, have been very disciplined for many years. I started writing in 1992, and I wrote for 10 years before I was published. So mm. I wrote thousands of miles of unpublished words. And so I trained myself to write and to, to really be on the moment I'm at the keyboard. So mm. I am one of those that can produce a lot and, and create a lot, but it came from discipline, a lot of discipline, yeah. Wow, that's good. Now, I, I, one thing I discovered when I wanted to be a writer, right, you know? <laughs> right? In other words, someone else pay me to do it, right? Yes, yeah. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I got turned down by everybody. I mean, mm -hmm. I. I I wrote and I had some good people read it, you know, yeah. and got passed over and passed over. And then I, I, I think it was Ted Decker mm. told me that the first novel of his was actually like his fifth or sixth yes. that he wrote. Okay, yeah. yep. And I kept hearing the Frank Peretti same kind of thing mm -hmm. and then some of the nonfiction people. And I realized, okay, if you're going to be a writer, you got to just write. Mm -hmm. You don't write because someone's paying you, you write because you love it. Is that right? Yes. Because that, that's what I'm hearing from you. Yes, definitely. And I know, like, some people when they meet me, they're like, oh, you're a writer, you've written all these books, and they have this perception that I'm driving a Mercedes or something <laughs> on my royalties. And <laughs> yeah. a writer really makes very little money, and what so are, you have to love it. What, what is, love what's it. this term, royalty? <laughs> what is this word you speak I, of? Yeah, yeah, I don't know what that is. <laughs> I haven't received those In, yet. Interesting. So I guess yeah. here's, here's my question for all the writers out there, the writer wannabes. Yes. What's your best advice? My best advice is to write and write and write. And that's how you discover your voice. And like you said, if you're passionate about it, you will write every day, you know, maybe not on Sunday, but you will write and and you'll notice that no matter where you go throughout your day, you're going to be getting ideas and yep. always write those yep. down and capture them. And yep. And I would say um, what Malcolm Gladwell shares in, uh, in his book, whatever the title is, which I can't remember, but anyway, it was not the tipping point, but another outliers, there it is. Uh, Mal Malcolm Gladwell said that the power of genius comes from 10,000 hours of practice. Wow. And that's a lot of time. So wow. if you want to be published, 10,000 hours of apprenticeship will do it. Oh, so yeah. simple, that's all you have to do. Uh, that's it, there you go, there's the <laughs> Easy. secret. You heard it from Mary DeMuth. <laughs> uh, check out her book, Everything. Check out her website, marydemuth.com, correct? Yes, that's okay. right. We'll put that on the screen. And, uh, and do check out Fiction, Nonfiction. It's all good stuff. And you're available to speak? I am. I speak a lot, and I really enjoy it. Men and women, all sorts of groups, all, all over right. the country and the world. Great. Go to her website and get information on that. Have her come speak to your writer's group, your church, your women's group, whatever. Uh, it's good stuff. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much.